Hello again and welcome to this next instalment in our series on mean opinion score. And this time we're looking at the algorithms Polka and PESC, what they are and how to choose between them. Okay, well, let's put Polka and PESC into some kind of context. We start with subjective or true mean opinion score, MOS, at the centre of this diagram. If you remember from the first video, that is the actual reference for mean opinion score. Subjective listening tests are where it all comes from. Then moving out to the next layer, we have objective MOS, and this is where we find Polka and PESC and uh, some similar algorithms as well. And these make predictions from sound recordings of the outcome of subjective MOS. So they're very closely related to subjective MOS itself. Then in the outer circle, we have uh, what we might call synthetic MOS. And this is a class of algorithms which looks at the packet behavior in a network, loss and jitter, and also knows the codec which is being used and uses this information to synthesize a mean opinion score or MOS. So that's a third way of doing it, which has less to do with the actual end-to-end -end performance, but rather more to do with estimating performance based on network behavior. So to see how Polka and PESC are used, let's just go back to an ordinary human phone call. And here we see a guy sitting in a call center making a call to a person using a mobile phone. And he just speaks, she listens, she replies, and the conversation is established that way. And the use of Polka and PESC simply consists of replacing those two users, A and B, at each end of a call with a measuring system which will do two things. First of all, it will inject a clean reference speech signal into one end of the call. And secondly, it will capture and measure and analyze that signal at the far end of the call. And of course, it can do that in both directions. So that a typical test sequence may sound something like this. The frosty air passed through the coat. The hogs were fed chopped corn and garbage. And so here is some of the terminology that we see in relation to this kind of testing. We've already mentioned the reference file. That's the clean speech signal which is used, which is injected in this case on the left-hand side at end A. And the corresponding degraded wave file, which is the recording, in fact, of the speech that actually arrived at end B of the call. And it's the comparison of those two that leads to Polka or PESC generating that estimate of mean opinion score. There's also the term intrusive testing because this is not a call involving our two human people, Andy and Benita. It's using an instrument instead to do the calling. So this is a test call. In other words, it's a call which is dedicated to the purpose of testing. And therefore, we have the term intrusive testing for that process. And here's a little bit of the history of these algorithms. First of all, looking at the purpose of them and how that's changed over, over these years. You can see we start in around 1996. Of course, there was development for some years before that. And they were initially produced for codec evaluation because I suppose that was the biggest part of the use of subjective testing. And this objective testing was designed as a lower cost and much more rapid and repeatable way of predicting those results. And then as time went by, the need became evident to use these techniques for network testing as well. And that is very much the case today, although codec evaluation is still a very valid application for these. Codecs themselves have evolved enormously in this period of time as well, so that you can see that the later techniques, PESC and uh, in particular Polka, are very finely tuned to the behavior of codecs uh, so that they can give realistic results for them and not be fooled by the way in which codecs behave. Now we come to the question of why PESC isn't quite sufficient for today's codecs and why we have Polka. Now, PESC has two scales, narrow band and wide band, but as it says here, they're not comparable. Now, why is that? Well, once again, this goes back to subjective listening tests and the fact that the listening conditions for a narrow band test 
and for a wideband test are not the same, and therefore the scores that come from those two types of test are not comparable. And this behaviour has carried through to PESC because PESC was designed to model or reproduce the results of subjective tests, be they narrowband or wideband, and it has the effect that, for example, a narrowband score of 3.3 is not the same as a wideband score of 3.3. And that fact has caused quite a lot of consternation in the mobile industry because, naturally, as operators and manufacturers introduced wideband or HD voice into their networks, they expected to be able to show numerically that the performance of those networks was better than it was with the previous generation or narrowband services. And yet, if you take a narrowband test and a wideband test and compare the results, you may have numbers which look numerically quite similar, but they don't in any way demonstrate how much better wideband sounds to the average user than narrowband. So that was a that was a limitation of PESC. And the second limitation there at the top is that PESC cannot evaluate speech above 7 kilohertz. So 7 kilohertz takes us up to the top of the HD voice or wideband speech audio spectrum, but it doesn't go beyond that. And we already have services. Skype is a good example, but also cellular services are moving up beyond that into the super wide band and even into the full band arena as well. So much higher range of frequencies. Now, Polka, by contrast, has a narrowband scale, but it also has a universal super wideband scale. And by universal, I mean that for the first time, it can be used to compare the performance of narrowband, wideband or HD voice and super wideband signals. And in fact, in the next evolution of Polka, Polka will be able to go up to full band service evaluation as well. Another limitation of PESC is that it cannot resolve time warping correctly. Now, time warping is a characteristic of some modern codecs by which the playout speed of a part of a speech signal can be faster than the characteristics of the original speech, which enables the codec to recover lost time. And it does this very cleverly, typically by maintaining the correct pitch. So normally, if you speed up the play out of something, you expect the pitch to rise, but that, that doesn't happen. So in the case of time warping, PESC is confused and tends to give a pessimistic score. Polka tracks this time warping capability or behavior and therefore gives more realistic scores. So this is one of the key benefits. So just to summarize the, the two key benefits of Polka over PESC. One is the universal super wideband scale, or soon to be universal full band scale, which enables a, a valid comparison of signals of all the speech bandwidths from narrow band through wide band, super wide band up to full band, potentially. And the other key feature of Polka is that it's able to track time warping codec behavior. So those are the two characteristics of Polka which make it a very necessary replacement for PESC in some applications. And we will look at those in just a moment. And so this table hopefully makes some sense now in relation to what we've just been talking about. We see on the left a list of mostly codecs, but also test purpose. So we have legacy codecs there, including G711, G722, and then some of the later codecs, uh, AMR wideband, EVS, state of the art, Skype codecs, Silk evolving to Opus, and FaceTime audio. And these modern codecs have the time warping characteristics that we were talking about just now, and also have the ability to go up beyond narrowband, so into wideband in the case of EVS, all the way up to full band. In the case of Skype, certainly currently up to super wideband or part of the super wideband range, potentially also into full band. And there are requirements, of course, to evaluate the user experience here in comparative terms between narrowband, wideband, super wideband, and indeed full band. So on the right hand side of this chart, we have the preferred metric and scale, which we suggest might be 
the most relevant to use for each of these applications on the left hand side and we see an evolution with the dotted line in the bottom right hand corner from super wideband to full band and this reflects an evolution in polka polka is currently limited to super wideband frequencies but will take on the capability of full band fairly soon so that's been a quick overview of Polka and PESC, how they're used and when to choose between them. And for further information, these two documents published by the ITU are the respective usage guides, which contain very specific information and are recommended reading. And they are written in a way that you don't have to be a voice quality expert to understand them. They're quite specific and I believe quite clear as well and direct in their message. Finally, I'd like to say thank you for watching and listening and to remind you that in the next video in this series, we will be talking about the very important subject of selecting the reference speech for use with Polka and PESC. So particularly for Polka, it's vitally important to use appropriate material, suitable material, and we shall go into that and look in a little more detail about what that means in practical terms. If you would like to have some advance notification of that, just drop us an email at this address. Once again, thank you and see you next time.